Well, hello. Welcome to Rod Martin Live for this week. Uh, my buddy Avilio Silvera isn't with us because we have two guests this week. We've never done that before, but we're always trying to add value. Uh, our first guest this week is actually a rock star of the conservative movement, my friend Frank Gaffney, who is the founder and president of the Center for Security Policy, absolutely the top think tank in the world on security, uh, U.S. interests around the world, and you just can't do better than to go to centerforsecuritypolicy.com or .org, just like rodmartin.org, where you should always go every single day, forever and ever, amen. Uh, rodmartin.org is proud, proud to occasionally refer you over to Frank's website because it is just chock full of goodness. And um, once in a while, Frank's even kind enough to run something I write. So, so you want to be sure to check out Center for Security Policy if you aren't already a fan. Anyway, Frank's here with us because uh, he's on vacation, which is good because I don't think he ever gets a vacation. And, uh, and he came down here to beautiful Destin, Florida, uh, a place that if you aren't familiar with, you need to be. We make it our home, but it is also home every year to about 4 million tourists. There's a reason that our little town of 12,000 has so many folks come every single year and you should be one of them. But while he's on vacation, we're just hijacking that for a little bit. We're going to take him to lunch here in a little while. But in the meantime, we're going to talk about Korea. So Frank, tell us what's going on. Well, what's going on at the moment, as you know, Rod, is what's been going on for quite some time now. In fact, if you really reflect on how we got here, you pretty much got to start with the end of the Korean War because the armistice line that was drawn was within proximity to the capital of South Korea, such that massed forces on the northern side of that demarcation line, that DMZ, demilitarized zone as they call it, can attack South Korea's capital, Seoul, from a standing start with artillery pieces and then ultimately rockets and now missiles. So we've been confronting this dangerous regime in the north capable at any moment of attacking both our allies in South Korea and our own forces there. And we've been watching over time, facing that reality, as the North Koreans, under a succession of despotic Kim Dynasty figures, have become more and more and more dangerous, not just to the South Koreans, and not just, frankly, to our friends and our forces in Japan, and now our forces in Guam, but actually to the United States mainland as well. And we're watching a president who is now sort of reaping the whirlwind of a succession of, I'm sorry to say, both Republican and Democratic administrations that mm -hmm. have failed to confront this kind of metastasizing danger before now reckoning with the fact that this is becoming totally unacceptable to have a regime that has made no secret, indeed repeats it endlessly, their desire to destroy us, having the means to do it here in the United States mainland as well as, again, overseas. So this is where we are at the moment. Donald Trump is saying uh, this is unacceptable, and the question is now, will the North Koreans Will their Chinese sort of uh, uh, prop up operation, will our friends in the region, and will we, the American people, support him in trying to do something about this problem? Indeed. Now, for those of you watching, we've talked a lot about this on rodmar.org through the years, and especially this year particularly in context of, of our assessment, and I'm not sure that Frank will agree, so we're going to find out if, if I'm just completely talking out of my hat here in a minute. But, but we have assessed for some time now that North Korea is by no means crazy, not at all irrational, that from their perspective they are projecting a persona to the world that is calculated very much to cause people to think of them as ferocious and crazy, 
so that we kind of give them a wide berth and say, ah, don't want to mess with that. There are other problems in the world. We'll get back to them. This is born of weakness. North Korea is exceedingly weak compared to the people around it, whether you're talking about China or Russia, or for that matter, in some ways, South Korea, but certainly the United States. And so by projecting this idea of ferociousness and possibly insanity, they are able to defend themselves with something of a Potemkin village, as it were. Now, that doesn't mean they're not strong in many respects. And you mentioned the artillery around Seoul. I was with General Mike Keltz last night, and he was describing the way this artillery is concealed within the mountain range just above Seoul. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I think it probably runs the gamut from stuff that's relatively exposed to stuff that's deeply buried in mountains and pulled out, you know, for the purposes of firing. Um, but the point is that there are tens and tens of thousands of these artillery tubes, some of which have simply high explosive ordnance in them, and some of which may have chemical weapons or perhaps even biological weapons which would be capable of causing immense damage to the millions and millions of people in and around uh, Seoul in South Korea. And I just, I'd add one point. I think I do agree with your general prognosis of what's going on here. I'd add, though, that what the North Koreans have figured out is the more belligerent they are, the more dangerous they seem, the more unpredictable, even crazy, they may be perceived as being the more likely they're to be rewarded. Oh, and that has been repeatedly, yes. It's that people will give them stuff, whether it's food, whether it's money, whether it's energy, um, or whether it's just a complete carte blanche to do what they will, certainly to their own people, and from time to time, at least, to the people of South Korea as well. Notably, in the past, they've, they've killed most of the cabinet of the South Korean government. Now, now, you heard that. They actually killed the cabinet, or a large part of it, of the neighboring country. And this didn't even result in a war. Can you imagine this kind of activity? This is just, this is just insane seeming. But actually, the United States doesn't want to get into a war with them and allows them to go forward with this behavior. You mentioned the bribes, and this is true both in the Clinton administration and in the Bush administration of course, Obama as well. What all have we given them? Well, the most important thing, I believe, is we've given them time. Mm -hmm. We've given them the space to continue doing what... As we have with Iran. Indeed. Well, yes. and that's a point to come back to, Rod. But just staying with North Korea for a minute, we've given them the space and time in which to pursue these ambitions that have been held by Kim Il-sung, the founder of this dynasty, Kim Jong-il, the uh, successor, mm -hmm. the father of the current despot, Kim mm -hmm. Jong-un. These guys have all sought what is now coming into being, which is the capacity to attack the most distant enemy, the most serious enemy they see, namely us, mm -hmm. in our homeland. And what's worrying in particular is that that time has translated not only into the nuclear weapons with which to do that and the ballistic missiles of longer and longer range with which to deliver those weapons. We've also seen a lot of circumstantial evidence, at least, that what they've specialized in, what they've made as a specific focus of effort, is acquiring the capacity to use something called electromagnetic pulse yes. to attack this country's most significant and most ominous vulnerability, namely our electric grid. And most of us don't think much about this, frankly. I think we kind of take it for granted that if we come into a room and flip the switch, the lights will come on or the air conditioning will work or our financial transfers will take place, or we'll get the water out of the tap, or the food out of the store, what have you. All of these things, of course, depend critically, as you know, on electricity. If there isn't any, over a protracted period of time, and a large part of this country, by some estimates, nine out of 10 of us are gonna die. Oh, yes. The thing that's worrisome 
most worrisome, the whole scenario that we've been talking about is colleagues of mine, including the former director of Central Intelligence, Jim Woolley, under Bill Clinton, mm -hmm. and another terrific expert on this subject, Dr. Peter Vincent Pry, have concluded, based on this circumstantial evidence, that the North Koreans may already have aboard one or both of the satellites orbiting the Earth, including overflying our country regularly, a nuclear device optimized to create that kind of electromagnetic pulse at an altitude that with a single weapon could enable them to cover essentially the electric grid of the entire mainland of the continental United States, which in theory, would give them the capacity to end the United States, certainly as we've known it, with a single weapon at a time of their choosing. Well, and, and actually, since you bring that up, I just want to point out, again, I mentioned centerforsecuritypolicy.org. There is nobody in the world, except maybe our enemies, working harder on the issue of electromagnetic pulse than Frank Gaffney. If you want to understand that issue and if you want to help defend America against that issue, I want to, I encourage you to support Frank's work at centerforsecuritypolicy.org. These are the guys on the front line trying to keep you safe. And if you know anything about EMP, you know that it is a dangerous threat to this country, to all of civilization, and frankly, not taken seriously enough in the centers of power. So, so again, centerforsecuritypolicy.org and my friend Frank Gaffney. Go on. The tragic piece of this is that what is generally not understood, so thank you for that plug, uh, because it is important that the American people become knowledgeable about this and demand corrective action, because this is the good news, Ron, as you know. Bad as this problem is, this is something we can fix. Oh, yes. The way I came across this was back when I worked for President Reagan a lifetime ago and learned that the United States military was spending tens of billions of dollars to protect what it considered to be its most important assets, its strategic mm -hmm. nuclear forces and command and control and the like against this effect of electromagnetic pulse. So we have a lot of expertise that could be applied to the civilian electric grid. Indeed, interestingly enough, the military relies on that grid for about 85%, sure. sorry, 99% sure. of its missions uh, here in the United States. Um, the rest of us basically have 85% of mm -hmm. their electricity coming from the private sector. And this is kind of part of the problem. The private sector doesn't think it's its problem to deal with a national security threat. The national security community doesn't think it's its problem to deal with the assets of the private sector, important as they are, and everybody's kind of pointing to somebody else to do something about it. But uh, if I could just plug another website, securethegrid.com is a place where we've got- Securethegrid.com. A lot of resources on this particular problem and how people can help fix it. But the tragedy is, even if most of us are unaware of what we've been talking about, every single one of our enemies understands this vulnerability. And some realize that they may not be able to get a nuclear weapon or they may not be able to get it up into space, but they could use physical sabotage. And you're from California. I know back in uh, 2013, somebody came within that close of a margin of taking out Silicon Valley's electricity in much of Northern California, just with shooting up a transformer substation yeah. out there near San Jose. And then there's cyber warfare. You know a lot about this, Rod, and I'm sure your listeners do as well. This is something we've seen the Russians use against Ukraine. Mm -hmm. in Absolutely. Indeed, using against assets in the Ukrainian grid very much like ones that we have. Perhaps a, a warning to us. But in any event, we're on notice that the bad guys in this world, whether the North Koreans or the Russians or the Chinese or the Iranians, as you mentioned, are all cognizant of the fact that they can take us down by attacking our sort of soft underbelly, our most critical of critical infrastructures. And just lastly, you mentioned it, Ron. Um, I did want to just say, 
the Iranians and the North Koreans have basically been joined at the hip in terms of their nuclear and Indeed. missile programs. So everything we're worrying about with respect to the North Koreans now, whether it's electromagnetic pulse attack or whether it's just you know nuclear delivered um, payloads on ballistic missiles, uh, or for that matter, a host of other more conventional or unconventional techniques, including chemical and biological weapons. That's basically the cash crop of North Korea. Indeed. The Iranians, especially after what I call the Obama bomb deal, are awash with cash. Sure. So they've been able to buy from anybody, including their North Korean allies, technologies that will threaten us in much the same way that the North Koreans are now doing. So uh, we're looking at a dangerous world, unfortunately, and I think um, Donald Trump has the unenviable task of trying to contend with the eight years of legacy of the Obama administration in allowing all of these problems to fester and become much worse. Oh, yeah. As we close this segment and we're getting ready for our second guest, you're going to love Phil Roberts, and we're coming right to him. But as we close up this segment, does Donald Trump successfully navigate this Korean crisis? I pray he will, needless to say. In part, I have to tell you, I think this depends on whether he's got the right people around him. And I've been very concerned, as I think you know, that uh, in H.R. McMaster, a lieutenant general yes. he's had as his uh, national security advisor, he does not have the right man. And he doesn't have, as a result, the right people staffing his national security establishment. Indeed. The National Security Council. I hope he's going to remedy that, and if he does, I think that he will have the talent as well as the leadership vision that uh, are necessary, and there's no guarantees here, but that are necessary to navigate this very difficult path. Well, we know you're in there fighting for us, and we know that if Donald Trump listens to you, we're going to be fine. So thank you, Frank Gaffney. Thank you so much. Thank you for being on Rod Martin Live, and... We're about to have a treat for you. Not just one interview, but two. So I'm going to run you off, Frank, and Phil Roberts, come sit in the hot seat. Phil Roberts is an old, old friend of mine. For 11 years, he was president of Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, and in those 11 years, every single year, the seminary had record growth. He's been a missionary all over the world. He's currently head of International Theological Education at Global Ministries Foundation, which is a wonderful organization. What, what's the URL for that, Phil? The URL? Yeah, the, the internet address. Oh, uh, just, <laughs> just Google. Phil is just not Google. the most tech-savvy guy in the world. <laughs> just just go to GMF Online. Is GMF that Online, and Dot. my email is... Uh, P. Roberts at gmfonline.org. .org. Okay, GMF, like Global Ministries Foundation Online.org. So, <laughs> Phil, Phil. Yes, sir. Phil, again, goes all over the world working with, with uh, budding seminaries and pastors, and, and he has a little bit different perspective on the Korean crisis, perhaps. Uh, in that he works with Christians and Christian ministries in South Korea that obviously would be gravely affected by what's going on today. So, Phil, tell us about the state of the church in, in Korea. This is really well, an amazing it, story it, most people it, don't know about. It's one of the most amazing stories in modern Christian history, really. You go from a country 65 years ago that had one of the worst economies in the world, bottom four, five, six economies, you go from a country that had 1% of its population who were professing Christians, and today you have a Christian population that's approximately 40% of the country's population, and the largest churches in the world, by the way, are not in Texas. They are in South Korea. I don't know, Phil. That may be heresy. <laughs> I mean, you're messing with Texas. I mean, there's some great churches in Texas and some large churches in Texas, but the finest church facility. I've ever been in in my life is in Seoul, Korea, Sarong Community Church. A little $100 million property they bought across the street from the Supreme Court uh, building, and they invested about $200 million in building an 18-story twin tower, eight stories beneath ground. Part of that is a bomb shelter, of you can imagine. That church not only does that, they support by themselves 300 full-time missionaries that they themselves organize 
wind logistical support wow. to maintain around the world. There are other stories like that. I have a friend, uh, Dong Wan Daniel Lee, went back, he was a Korean uh, resident in the United States, did his theological studies here, went back to Korea in 1995, and the Global Missions Church in Bundang, uh, they run 35,000 on Sunday. Wow. And they themselves support 300 plus missionaries and have an amazing ministry to disabled people, to senior adults, and have impacted the world for the gospel. So what we see today is not just a political face-off, it's a ideological, a worldview, a theological face-off with you know, the, the apotheosis of uh, uh, Kim Jong-un and his grandfather Kim Il-sung and his father as well versus what is a burgeoning Christian worldview because the people in South Korea will say, how do we grow from one of the worst economies in the world to one of the best top 10 economies in the world? It was by basically incorporating a Christian worldview that had a high work ethic, a high value on the individual, on freedom, on religious freedom, and uh, it's an amazing land to visit. So we need to really pray that what I think is not just a political issue, it's a spiritual issue and a spiritual warfare issue comes to a happy resolution. Absolutely. Now, before we go on with that line of thought, I do want to highlight something Phil just said. And you know, we talk about this a great deal at rodmartin.org, which I trust you're reading at least five times a day, if not more. <laughs> Memorizing. Uh, that's right. <laughs> Memorizing rodmartin.org every day. Uh, I'm sure that my daughter Haley does that, and uh, she's over here giggling at the thought while she runs the camera. So, so at rodmartin.org, we spend a lot of time talking about the Christian roots of capitalism, and that just seems very discordant to many, many people in today's world, including a lot of Christians who really probably ought to learn a little bit more about their Bible, I guess, because what they seem to not understand is that the essence of capitalism is that even a person who is completely self-focused can only get paid if he solves someone else's problem. Capitalism can be abused just like any other thing in life because this is a world full entirely of fallen sinful people. And so they are always corrupting whatever they touch. It's just it's just how this world works. That's, that's what you can expect. It, it wouldn't matter if, if they went to the neatest birthday party in the world, somebody would throw a fit. It's just what humans are. But you can complain about the abuses of capitalism, but what you cannot miss is that in capitalism, I only get rewarded when I stand in someone else's shoes, try to understand what it is they need or want, and then fill that need. And even then, unlike under socialism, such as in horrible North Korea, even then I don't get paid unless the person wants the solution that I created. Now that is daylight and dark different from every other thing in the world. And, and let me point out the, what should be obvious. It's the fulfillment of the golden rule. You are actually doing unto others as you would have them do unto you. You're actually loving your neighbor as yourself when you invent a better phone, when you invent a polio vaccine, when you invent a better car. Whatever you're doing is making the world better. Maybe just a little bit, maybe a whole lot, but it is actually taking care of the others around you, even when your motives are not pure. And that is an, an amazing system, and we have seen the result of that in South Korea. Daylight and dark different from North Korea, which has taken the supposedly more compassionate, supposedly more altruistic approach, and its people live in famine under a dictatorship. So, uh, so where, tell and us, by, and where, by the way, even to speak the name Jesus could get you in a world of trouble. Yes, to yes. own a Bible, to touch a Bible, or to open a Bible could end you up in a severe prison sentence. Well, and this is a country where people frequently are lucky to get to eat bark. I mean, this is a terrible, terrible place. And, and it is because of a very different worldview, uh, the same worldview that at this moment is collapsing Venezuela, which by all rights should be one of the richest countries in the world. It has the most oil of any country in the world, even more than Saudi Arabia, even more than Russia, even more than us. And yet, and yet they are literally, the people of Venezuela at this moment are literally having to eat garbage because of centralized statist control 
and the suppression of the individual initiative and innovation that is the essence of entrepreneurship and capitalism. So don't let Bernie Sanders fool you. What he's peddling is death. <laughs> and what we're talking about is freedom and the, and the uh, opportunity for humans to reach their full potential. And you've seen that, again, side by side on the Korean Peninsula. Now, a lot of that is because of the growth of Christianity, even, even more than merely the growth of a Christian view of these ideas. Phil, how many people in South Korea, percentage-wise, were Christian at the end of World War II? Well, 1% or less. 1%? And we're talking, at the end of the Korean War, it was about that 1% or, or less. And now it's? 40%. 40%. This is one of the greatest awakenings of the faith in human history. This is an amazing thing. And part of the issue there, too, Rod, is, number one, the Koreans' enormous prayer power. Prayer marks the life of that church. Early morning prayer meetings are uh, regular in the uh, life of the Korean church. I was asked to do an early morning prayer meeting in a church 6 a.m. Saturday morning. Now, how many people would you expect to find in an American church at a prayer meeting on 6 a.m. <laughs> Saturday morning? Well, probably not me. Well, <laughs> the auditorium was jam-packed. Wow. 6 a.m. Saturday morning. Everyone in place, when I walked in, they asked me to speak to them and have a sermon. They had a children's choir up there, 8 to 10 years of age, beautifully dressed, sang like birds, and that is commonplace in the life of Korea. They're a, a mission sending force. They're probably the second or third largest mission sending force in the world. Much of their activity. Oh my goodness. Yeah, much of their activity in Asia, but also in the M world, in the Muslim world. They are mission, they, they are uh, tremendous givers and philanthropists. My last year at seminary, we were finishing out our chapel. Korean church gave a U.S. seminary a million dollar gift. That same global mi uh, missions church in Bundang gave a million dollar gift to an American seminary so we could have a yes. free chapel. Yes, and by the way, that's an incredible chapel. It is at Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. And you can thank Phil Roberts for that. It is just magnificent. By, by the way, about and, then, and they're generous, man. I tell you, you go there and you speak or preach for them or you're their guest. You're treated like a king. Uh, you're rewarded and they express a financial appreciation for your ministry. And they're just gracious, generous, hospitable people. Christian oh, that's, people. that's incredible. Now, about what's the population of South Korea again? Uh, I think 40 million. Okay. 40, 50 million. Versus... 322 million Americans, and yet South Korea, which was 1% Christian when my parents were born, is the second largest missionary sending country in the world today. That is extraordinary. It truly, truly is. So let me turn that conversation just a little bit. As you see it, if this Korean crisis boils over into war, what is the effect on the church? Well, it'll be uh, catastrophic on the country financially in terms of loss of lives because the Korean, North Koreans, all they know is uh, building a great army. They don't, haven't built a great economy. They haven't built a great educational system. They haven't built any kind of entrepreneurial uh, enterprises of, of any significant source except selling coal principally. And all they know is war. So uh, South Korea will suffer because North Korea is armed to the teeth. They've got thousands of, of artillery pieces aimed this very moment at Seoul. And uh, even if we were to move militarily, I'm sure Frank Gaffney knows much more about this than anyone, uh, it'd be some time before we could knock out even uh, what's already in place. And thousands, if not millions of lives would be lost. So it would be a horrible loss in that sense. The Korean people are resilient. They love God. They love Jesus. They believe the, the scriptures. They will bounce back. The South Koreans, once the hostilities would be ended, but it would be a, a horrible setback for the cause of missions and for the cause of the evangelization of, of Southeast Asia, for sure. Well, we don't know what is coming, and we don't know what Donald Trump will do. I have tremendous faith that Donald Trump will do what needs doing, and that is a huge relief compared to 
all three of his most recent predecessors who have just let this problem fester and fester and fester some more. We are at the point we're at in large part because we have coddled North Korea and we have coddled Iran. We have allowed them to get to the point where they are a danger and where millions of lives could be lost. And I want to tell you, I am grateful that a man that I did not support in the primaries, that I actually bundled against in the primaries, has been so strong on this issue. And actually, if you will look on our Facebook page, you will see a video I posted yesterday, reposted from Ken Blackwell, uh, where Donald Trump is talking about his approach to North Korea all the way back in 1999. And it is alarmingly consistent with where he is today. So that that's worth your time. Yeah. Phil, in these last moments before we go, do you have anything else you'd like to tell our audience? Well, they need to really be praying for Korea. I know the Koreans are praying, but this is a time when we need to step up to the plate and pray for them. If you have Korean friends, call, email, encourage them. Uh, thank God for what is happening in South Korea because what is happening in North Korea spiritually is due to the impact of things like radio ministries that are being beamed as possible into North Korea. People can have a radio, and some of those are being circulated by these ministries. Bible distribution as far as that's possible. So uh, this needs to be a, a real concern for us. The tensions will always be with us until there's a regime change in North Korea. And they've made Kim Jong-un a god. It's a form of idolatry. And the we, we Communism to, always does that. Always does that, but uh, I tell you what, what a powerhouse it would be if that, con if that country was ever re reunited. Pyongyang, oh, yes. the capital of North Korea, was, at one time was called the Jerusalem of Asia because that was the focus of so much Christian influence. The mother of Kim Il-sung was the pianist in the Methodist church in Pyongyang. Well, and Billy Graham's mother was educated in a Christian high school yes, there. Yes, yes. So, uh, or M Billy Graham's wife, excuse me. So we need to pray uh, for Korea, not only for Korea, but for the cause of the gospel and the influence that uh, growingly uh, Korea's had all over the world. Amen, amen. Well, you can read about the world anywhere. You come to rodmartin.org to understand it. We hope that if you are a casual observer, you will actually sign up for our regular emails, which are not so regular that they will burden your inbox. We usually send out the Rod Martin Report weekly, but at the moment, this summer, been a little lazy, been working on other things, so we're kind of terming that a weekly column published monthly. Nevertheless, <laughs> you can get our week's most read articles once a week. Again, we are not going to clutter up your, email, email, yeah, your inbox, but if you will go to rodmartin.org slash NAC, that's NAC as in New American Century, rodmartin.org slash NAC, we will give you my new special report on, yes, the new American century, why America in the 21st century will be stronger than you think. And we'd love for you to have that. We're about to bring out a couple additional things shortly that you're really going to like, including my new book, Why It Worked, which is all about how Donald Trump actually did get elected and what we can learn about or learn from that going forward as Republicans. So go to rodmartin.org slash NAC, sign up. We'll get you that special report. We appreciate you watching today. I also want you to be sure to check out centerforsecuritypolicy.org and Frank Gaffney, who again is America's leading advocate for national security and absolutely our finest expert and true warrior for the cause of American safety. And also GMF Online, that's GMF for Global Ministries Foundation, gmfonline.org, where you can check out Phil Roberts' work. And by the way, send both of these guys money because God knows they need it. <laughs> and they are doing the Lord's work if anybody in the world is. So for rodmartin.org, I'm Rod Martin. This is Rod Martin Live coming to you live from Grace Hall in Destin, Florida. And we are grateful that you are part of this with us. Have a great day.